We'll turn to James 1, James 1, and we're going to look at a few verses here as we think about doing the Word, doing the Word. You know, ladies, we can come and we've had a, a few sessions that have just been practical. We've had a few that have been expositional. But if you leave here, and I see all of you are leaving already, so they've already had enough. But uh, if you leave this afternoon and you don't take the things that you've been instructed in this week that are biblical and put them into practice, then might as well have not come. We talked about that last night. There's really no point in you coming just to learn more knowledge, right? We want to do the Word. That's what false teachers do, right? They just get more knowledge or more of this, but they don't do the Word. So we want to do the Word. So by way of opening, I want you to imagine that I'm the owner of a rapidly growing company and that you are my assistant and I want to expand our company overseas, but in order to do that, I've got to leave. And I'm going to go to Europe for about six months and do some work over there to expand the company. And I'm going to leave you in charge of the company while I am gone. And I take my family over there, and I tell you I'm there. I'm going to be send, you know, calling you, sending you emails on what you are to do while I'm away. And I'm leaving you in charge of the company while I'm gone. And so I do. I go away for six months. And I come back. And in the meantime, I've been sending you all these letters about what you're supposed to do to keep the company back here in America going. And so I come home and get off the plane and take my wife and kids home, and, or my husband and kids home, but so that doesn't sound very good, my husband and my children home. And I come to the office, and I'm driving to the office, and as I approach, I'm stunned as I pull into the parking lot. Because grass and weeds have grown up all in front of the building. I notice a few of the windows have been broken. No one's repaired them. And I walk into the receptionist room, and she's doing her nails, chewing gum, you know, listening to her favorite Pandora station. And I look around, I notice the waste baskets look like the three and Debbie's in my hotel room this morning as we were leaving. They were overflowing with stuff. I'm like, how could two women have this much trash in two days? And nobody in the office seems concerned that I've returned, the owner of the company. And so I asked the receptionist, I say, hey, where, where's so-and-so, the one that I've been sending these letters to while I've been gone? So she goes, ah, are you down there, down the hall, you know, he's in, he's in the room where they're playing cards. So I, I go in there and I'm, I look at you and you guys are playing poker and I'm like, what, what is going on here? And you go, what do you mean, boss? What do you mean what's going on here? And I said, just look at this place. Are you, have you seen the trash cans? Have you seen the yard? Have you seen the windows? Nothing's been done while I've been gone to Europe for six months. Didn't you get my letters? Yeah, 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 boss, we got every one of those letters. As a matter of fact, boss, we've had letter study every Friday night since you've left. We even divided all the personnel here into small groups, and we've discussed those things you wrote. Some of those things are very interesting. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know, boss, that even some of your employees even committed to memory some of your sentences and some of your paragraphs. In fact, one or two memorized an entire letter. There's great stuff in, that, in those letters, boss. And so I say, okay, okay. You got my letters, you studied them, and you meditated on them and discussed them but what did you do about them? Do? Uh, we didn't do anything about them. Now, ladies, that behavior would be professional suicide, wouldn't it? That'd be the end of that company. But are we not just as absurd spiritually when we hear God's word without the slightest inclination to obey the letters he's written to us, that is spiritual suicide. In fact, James puts it this way in James 1.22. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man that beholds his natural face in a mirror, he beholds himself, goes his way, and forgets what manner of man he is. But whosoever looketh unto the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he being not a forgetful hearer of the word, but a doer of the word, this man 
will be blessed in what he does. Now, you just have two points here to this outline. We are going to look at the danger of being a hearer only, and then we're going to look at the delight of being a doer always. Again, we're jumping in the middle of a text, which is not my favorite thing to do, but here we are. And if you will notice, James has just been talking about the Word of God and the responses we are to have for the Word of God. In fact, this verse is often taken out of context. We're to be slow to speak, slow to wrath. Did you know that that is towards the word of God? A lot of people will use this as in relationship to each other. Wherefore, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And then he talks about putting away all sin so you can receive the, the engrafted word with meekness, the word that is able to save your soul. And so he's been talking about the word of God. But, ladies, as we consider the fact that each of us that know Christ have been implanted with the genuine Word of God, we have to consider that if we are implanted with the genuine Word of God, as James has just mentioned, we should have more and more of a desire to have a practical obedience to the Word of God that has been implanted in our souls. That's why James says, but be doers of the word. In the Greek, it means make sure that you are. Make sure you are. I appreciate that question that was asked. What if these sessions are making me feel like I'm not saved? Well, I would say what James says. Make sure that you are. It indicates that some in James' day, just like some in our day, they regularly listen to the word of God, but they're not real disciples. They were interested in hearing the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament apostles' doctrine, but they lacked obedience. And ladies, this is not a new idea to the Jewish reader that James is is writing to, and it shouldn't be a new idea to us. In fact, if you would, turn over to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. The Lord warned the nation of Israel about this through Moses. Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book so that you can fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid They will cling to you. Every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, will the Lord bring upon you you, till you are destroyed. You will be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and multiply you, So the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing and you will be plucked off the land which you go to possess. Did you notice what he said? If you do not carefully what? Do, observe these things. Then what's going to happen? I'm going to come and destroy you. Ladies, Doers of the word do not refer to the person who sporadically obeys, but the one who habitually, regularly obeys the word of God. Now, obviously, no one in here is perfect. Nobody in here right now has not gone, it's 110 now, you have not gone this day without sinning. And if you have, well, we need to talk. A doer of the word is not in perfection, but there should be a consistent obedience to the word of God, a desire. In fact, the way James says this, he says, do the word, do the word. It's a kind of a person that we should be. It's not an act we perform. We're just, we just do the word. <laughs> We're just doers of the word. In fact, Paul mentions this idea in the letter to the Romans. He says, for not the hearers of the law are justified in his sight, but what? The doers of the law. Hearing does you no good, right? It's got to be the doing. It's just like you might give your child a command, go clean up your room. 
They can hear that command all they want, but if they don't do it, they haven't obeyed, right? In fact, uh, one of my children, I would tell them to go clean up their room, and 20 minutes later, I'd go upstairs and hadn't been done, and they said, I forgot. Well, guess what? You're still going to be disciplined. I gave you a command. You didn't obey. We can hear all we want, but we need to do. Jesus said it this way, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they what? Yeah, they follow me. What does that mean? They do the word. Ladies, it's one thing to run in a race. It's something else to be a runner, right? It's one thing to teach a class, but it's another thing to be a teacher. It's one thing to bake a cake. I can bake a cake, but it's another thing to be known as a baker. I remember when I took a cake baking class with my daughter and daughter-in-law a long, long time ago, They were taking the class so they could be bakers, and they make beautiful cakes. I took the class so I could be with them and eat the icing. That was the whole reason for it. I admit it. And I am not known. I mean, I love to bake, but I don't make beautiful cakes like my daughter and daughter-in-law do. Runners are known for their running. Teachers are known for their teaching. Bakers are known for their baking. Likewise, doers of the word are known for what? doing the word. Would someone say that about you? If I ask your husband or your parent, does so-and-so do the word? Would they say, yeah, for the most part, she does. She's a doer of the word. Ladies, the direction of our life should be obedience to the Lord, not sporadic obedience, not partial obedience, but a doer of the word. Well, James continues his warning that we should not be hearers only. In the Greek, a hearer refers to one who audits a class. You know what auditors are, right? Have you ever audited a class? Um, Some people go to college and they audit the class. And you know when you audit a class, you go to the class and you hear the lecture, but you don't have to do the homework. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? So they listen, but they don't receive any credits for their class. They're just auditing. That's the Greek word here. Ladies, people who listen to God's word but never obey it, they're spiritual auditors. They delude themselves by thinking that hearing the word is all that God requires of them. Ladies, hearing the word is essential, but our obligation doesn't stop there. And I fear, I fear that many in our churches today are auditing the word of God. My husband and I see him all the time. They come to church, they listen to the same sermons I listen to every Sunday, but their lives never seem to change. They're auditing church. They're auditing the Word of God. In fact, I heard a story, it was a true story, about a pastor who came to church. He had, it was first Sunday in the pulpit, a new minister there, and he preached a sermon. The people loved him, thought it was great. Next Sunday, came around, he got up and preached the same sermon. And the uh, people that had called him came up to him and said, "Uh, Pastor, I I think maybe something's wrong. (laughs) You just preached that sermon last Sunday. Why did you just preach the same one? He said, well, when you obey the first one, we'll get on to the second one. (laughs) And uh, I thought, well, that's pretty good, you know. Once you get that one down, we'll move on to the second one. Maybe that'd be a good rule for our churches. Now, ladies, listen to what James is saying. If you hear the word only, but you don't do it, notice what he says, you deceive yourself. You deceive yourself. The Greek word means you are beside yourself. You have miscalculated yourself. You have reckoned wrongly. Now, what have you deceived yourself about? What have you miscalculated about yourself? Well, again, according to the larger context, and we don't have time to get into all of James, But this man, this woman has deceived themselves into thinking that all they have to do is hear the word, have a superficial encounter with it. The larger context is what James is saying, you've deceived yourself about your salvation. Right? Isn't that what Paul says? It's not the hearers of the law that are justified, it's the doers of the law. It's a frightening statement. Ladies, you're not deceiving God. He knows, and you're not deceiving the people around you. In fact, I didn't deceive my husband the first 11 years. In fact, the night before we got married, he almost called the wedding off because he began to wonder if I was a genuine Christian. And then, you know, I've told you before, I tore, tore my house down brick by brick, and 
He used to say he was going to put on my tombstone. She did it her way. So I wasn't deceiving my husband. He knew. In fact, when I got saved and baptized for the last time, I wasn't even deceiving my parents because when I called them to tell them I was going to be baptized for the fourth and final time, my mom said, I'm not surprised. I've seen the change. I wasn't even deceiving my own parents. So we can think we're, you know, deceiving people. But ladies, your closest friends, your family, they'll know. They know if you're just a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. Remember what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are, right? So the people around you know whether you live the word out or not. Jesus says what? You'll know them by their fruits. In other words, you'll know true believers by what they do, not by what they claim. I'm a Christian. I've been saved. Well, what does that look like? Ladies, the new nature from God manifests in a new life of obedience. You can't fool people for very long. They will know if you are a doer of the word. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say? Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom, but only those who what? There again it is, do. Do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast demons out in your name? And haven't I done many wonderful works in your name, Lord? I did all this. You know what he's going to say? He says, I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Ladies, as Jesus concludes this most profound sermon and the least obeyed, as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, he says it's a frightening thing that people have a mere profession of Christianity, but they don't possess it. It doesn't come into their life and change their life. And he says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom of heaven, only those who do the will of my Father. In fact, the Greek there for most, most is, is a Greek word that means uh, a lot. <laughs> mega, mega. In fact, when Jesus says in another place, few there be that find it, you know what the Greek word there is? Puny. Puny. Not very many. Few there be that find it. Ladies, it's not simply a verbal profession of Jesus Christ as Lord, but it's an obedience. Obedience. Jesus gives a chilling warning here. Frightening indeed. Well, by the way, it's interesting to note that the word many, as I said in, verse 20, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is the word most. Most will say to me in that day. James goes on to say in verse 23, For if anyone is like a hearer and not a doer, he's like a man. He observes himself in a mirror, beholds himself, and goes what way, and forgets what manner of person he is. It's interesting that this man is not glancing, verse 23, at himself in a casual way. But it's engaging. Notice, it's a careful, cautious, observant stare. So here we see a man or a woman. They're taking a good look at themselves. They're examining themselves with careful scrutiny. Ladies, listen very carefully. Hearers of the word are not necessarily superficial or casual in their approach to Scripture. They can be serious students of the word. And yet, the fact is, as chilling as it is, some Sunday school teachers, some pastors, some pastors' wives are not true believers. I know, I was one of them. <laughs> some even write biblical commentaries or books. Ladies, our response to the Word, not our depth of study, is the issue with God, right? Right? can study the Bible, you can memorize the Bible, but if you don't do the Bible, what's the point, right? Jesus says, James says, you're deceiving yourself. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead faith. John says, he that says, I know him, doesn't keep his commandments is a what? Liar. Secondly, the truth isn't in him. <laughs> He's not genuine. In fact, turn over to Ezekiel. I'm having you turn to some Old Testament passages, but this is good, right? I love the Old Testament. Read Ezekiel. Look at the verse, uh, chapter 33. Beginning in verse 30. Very sobering passage. He says, Also, son of man, 
The children of your people are talking against you by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they're speaking to each each other, everyone to his brother, and they're saying, Come, I pray, hear what the word that comes forth from the Lord. And they come to you, Ezekiel, as the people come. And they sit before you as my people. And they hear your words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after covetousness. And lo, you are unto them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice, and you can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, and lo, it will come to pass, (laughs) they will know that a prophet has been among them. Evidently, Ezekiel had a very popular following among the people. They recognized him as a prophet. Hey, let's go listen to Ezekiel. It's great. It's like going to a rock concert. You know, he's got a great voice. He sounds like a beautiful instrument, like a flute or a harp. Don't you love listening to Ezekiel? He's so great. God says they love to listen to you, but they will not do what you say. And Ezekiel was a prophet, prophet of the Lord. God says there's going to come a day, Ezekiel, when they would realize a prophet was among them and it's going to be too late. That's exactly what James is saying. You listen, you might study, you might memorize, but you don't heed. Now, he talks about this man that looks into a mirror, which is interesting. In fact, back Sunday when my husband was preaching, I don't know why he got on the topic of mirrors, but Oh, I know, he's, he's in Romans, and he was talking about how, how narcissistic our world is. It's gone from postmodern to being narcissistic. It's all about me, you know, selfie, selfie. And he said, by the way, go and destroy all the mirrors in your house. Of course, there's a lot of chuckling from the women in the church. But uh, mirrors in biblical times, they were de- very different from ours. And I agree with my husband. We have mirrors everywhere. I don't know if you've noticed. Everywhere you walk, you see a mirror. But the mirrors in the biblical times were made of uh, bronze or copper or tin, so they weren't uh, like perfected like ours. In fact, the people I'm going to Africa with, he's already warned me, they don't have mirrors in Africa. So I guess I you know, need to bring something so that I can put my contacts in. But the biblical mirrors, they did reflect, they had some image. It did reflect light, but they weren't like ours. But ladies, just like a mirror gives physical reflection of our faces, the Word of God is a spiritual mirror that gives a reflection of your heart. That's what James is saying. Well, after this, after the man looks himself in the mirror, notice what James says in verse 24. So he looks at his face in a mirror. He looks at himself. He goes his way, and he immediately forgets What manner of man he is. He forgets what he looks like. Despite the hearer's lingering look in the mirror, he fails to respond, and the image reflected in the mirror soon fades away. Ladies, James is giving us an illustration that we all can relate to. I mean, how many times do we look at ourselves in the mirror, you know? (laughs) Then we go away in a physical mirror and forget what we look like, right? And, uh, you know, a while ago, I ran, I had a, that's why I was late. I had to run to the bathroom, get back in here. I took a glance in the mirror. Oh, you look pretty bad. Guess get up there, you know? But you come up here and you forget what you look like. I forget I'm 63 years old and I'm sagging in all kinds of places and I have gray hair. And you just, you forget, right? You forget what you look like. We forget those defects. The same it is with the Word of God. It's like a mirror that has been held up before us this weekend, right? Several of you have come to the book table. I'm convicted. I've been really convicted. It hurts. (laughs) I'm hurt too, man. Debbie says, how do you live with yourself? Uh, we We see our sins, right? We see our defects. This weekend, And maybe you think, you know what? I really need to make some changes. I need to make some changes. You might have even been emotionally stirred this weekend. But I know that some of you are going to go out that door in just a few minutes and you're going to forget every word that you've heard this weekend. You're going to go home. You're going to turn the TV on. You're going to have a conversation with your husband. You're going to, you know, and you're going to forget everything you've heard. However... If you are a doer of the word, you will endeavor to remove 
those things that the Holy Spirit has been convicting you of this weekend and bring yourself to the conformity to what God requires by the help of His Holy Spirit. Ladies, sometimes our behavior, when we look into the mirror of God, is absurd when we think about it. Why do we come to church? Why do we come every Sunday? Why do we come to ladies' Bible study? Is it just knowledge? <laughs> we just want to learn, or do we want to socialize, you know? Or what, what is it? If we're not going to go and do the Word. How many of you can remember last Sunday's sermon at your church? And if you can remember, was your conscience stirred? What did you do about it? Did you make any changes? And by the way, uh, you know, sometimes when I uh, go to speak at these places and I get up in the morning, I look at myself and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, you need to do quite a bit of things before you go speak to these women. Like, you know, maybe a shower, wash your hair, you know, do something. And just like that benefits you, you know, for me to get up here and, you know, be look halfway decent while I'm teaching. That may be halfway or three-fourths or one-fourth. One but just like my showering benefits you, you know, so does my hearing and doing God's Word. It benefits those around me, right? Well, James says he goes away. He immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The going away here is a departure that was a settled condition. He did not return to the mirror for a second look. He didn't follow up with repeated inspections. The look into the mirror produced no result. <laughs> waste of time, waste of effort. Ladies, if you don't take action on what you see in the mirror, then why bother looking in the first place, right? Why do we look in the mirror? Why do we look in the mirror? Hopefully to, you know, we've got to fix our face or do something, blow our nose or whatever, you know get the lipstick off your teeth or spinach that's coming out. You know, why do we to make some changes, right? Now, I agree. Sometimes our physical appearance is so bad, we don't want to go back and look in the mirror a second time, right? And spiritually, too, you might not like what the Word reveals about your heart this weekend, right? So you really don't want to return to the Word of God for a second look. Or maybe some of you are sitting there saying, you know what, I have been convicted this weekend, but you know, I got to get through this weekend, I got to get back home, check on things, and I'll take care of that issue Monday, you know? I'll take care of that issue Monday or next week. What's the rush? Some of us will turn on the television, we'll get involved in busy work, and we drown out our convictions. So, what is the danger of being a hearer only? You've deceived yourself. James now turns to the delight of being a doer always. Look at verse 25 as we close. But in contrast to those who hear and don't do, we have this person in verse 25. Those who look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it, they're not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one is blessed in what he does. Verse 25, the Greek word look into there means to look down, lean, peer with care and precision. It's a penetrating look. It's the same Greek word used when Mary came and told the disciples that Jesus had risen from the dead. And Peter and John are running together to the tomb. And remember, John outruns Peter. He looks in the tomb and, you know, goes back out. But not Peter. <laughs> Peter, he's always the funny one. He goes in and he, I mean, he's like, what? And he's in there for a long time. He looked intently. He's like, you got to be kidding. What do you mean he's risen from the dead? That's what James is saying. This person looks intently. They, they go out of their way to study its pages, bending, stooping. What do I need to change, Lord? They look intently. In fact, the looking into in the Greek implies humility with a desire to clearly see Scripture and what it reveals about your own spiritual condition. So it's not just an action that you're doing. It's an attitude. You're not just coming for more knowledge as you peer into the Word of God. It's like, Lord, what do I need to change? I want to obey. Give me a heart to obey. James is describing the doer as one who has such an intense interest in the word that he goes out of his way to study and bend over its pages with a heart of humility to change. Does that describe you? 
Interesting, James calls the Bible the perfect law of liberty. Why does he call it that? Well, it's perfect because it's complete, right? I believe the Bible's complete. I believe it's sufficient. That's what James is saying. It's without error. It's perfect. Unlike an imperfect poor metal or silver mirror, the Word is perfect. It's also perfect because it's God's law, right? And He is perfect. And in addition to calling it the perfect law of liberty, what else does he call it? The law of liberty, perfect law, or excuse me, the perfect, he calls it a law of liberty. Now that may sound paradoxical to you, because we tend to think of law and freedom as opposites. But ladies, that's not true. Do you know as you look intently into the word, the Holy Spirit enables you to apply the principles to your life and therefore it frees you from the guilt and the bondage of sin? I remember when God saved me, that was one of the most life-changing things was the, the weight of my sin and the guilt was gone. That had never been before. And so it's the law of liberty. Seems opposites, but it's not. As we yield ourselves to what the Lord wants us to do, it's liberating. I remember when I started submitting to my husband. I wasn't a very submissive wife. No one was going to tell me what to do. And when I got saved and I realized what the Bible said about my role as a wife, and I started doing the Word, you know what I found? I found out submitting to my husband was liberating. It wasn't binding. It was the most liberating thing ever. Ladies, God's Word is not binding. It's liberating. It frees you from the guilt and bondage of sin and enables you to live to God's glory. That's freedom. That's true freedom. So a doer of the Word will look into the Word. They continue in it and they abide in it, which means they stay by it. They continue in it. It's like what we were talking about in our last session. Habitually gazing, daily discipline. It's like the psalmist, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Ladies, the psalmist was not just a Sunday learner. He was a persevering learner. The one who looks and continues to look is not a forgetful hearer. Notice what James says as he closed. He's not a forgetful hearer, but he's a doer of the work. Ladies, we don't forget what we hear. I know the older I get, I've noticed uh, there's sometimes I forget stuff. Debbie said, you know, don't you remember so-and-so from last year? I go, no, nope, don't remember that. Don't you remember this? Nope, don't remember that. And sometimes I'll say to her, don't you remember the color of that hotel room we stayed in last year? It was yellow. Nope, don't remember that. So the older I get, I'm like, I don't remember everything anymore. But a hearer, a doer of the word determines beforehand she's not going to forget what she's going to hear. Ladies, we should not come to hear the word of the Lord And say, I'm going to forget what I hear. The doer of the word knows that God's word is is unlike any natural mirror. Shows us our sin. Shows us how we can be right with God. And we want to conform to his standard. So a doer of the word does the work. They go out and do the work. And then notice what happens. Here's the big bonus. This one will be blessed in what they do. Not just the hearer, but the one that does. Blessing here is in the very act of obedience. Ladies, the blessing is not in the hearing, but in the doing. Just like the blessed one who endures under a trial, you will be blessed in the very act of keeping the law. What does Psalm 1911 say? Moreover, by them, talking about the word of the Lord, your servant is ward, and in keeping of them, there is what? Great reward. Great reward. The psalmist even says that in Psalm 1, the the one who meditates day and night. They're like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Their leaf doesn't wither. Whatever they does prosper. They're blessed. They're blessed. Ladies, there's a blessing in the doing, in the obeying. Obedience always brings blessing. Disobedience always brings cursing. If you don't believe me, read Deuteronomy 28 sometime. Very motivating portion of Scripture. So what is the danger of being a hearer only? You've deceived yourself into thinking you're saved. Are you a hearer only of God's Word? 
What is the delight of being a doer of the word of God? You will be blessed. Are you a doer of the word? When is the last time you did the word? That you were a doer of the word? Ladies, these verses are a call to examine ourselves. I know it's not popular, but we should examine ourselves, make sure that we are in the faith. Letters, Lord? Oh, yeah. I've got 66 of those letters. As a matter of fact, Lord, the ladies of our church participate in a letter study every Tuesday morning. We've divided all the women into small groups and we discuss those letters you wrote. Some of those things are really interesting. You'll be pleased to know that a few of us have actually committed to memory some of your sentences and paragraphs. Some of us are working on memorizing an entire letter. That one from James, there's great stuff in that letter. Okay, you got my letters. You've studied them. You've meditated on them, and you've discussed them and memorized them. But what are you doing about them? Let's pray. Father, as we close out this conference of being a woman of the Word, I pray for my dear friends here at Cornerstone Church and the other churches that are represented here this weekend, Lord, that you would... Give them a delight in your word, a desire for your word, diligence in your word. But more than that, Father, that they would be doers of the word. I don't want any of them to be deceived into thinking that all they needed to do was to come this weekend and hear. But Lord, I want them to know that they must go out now and be doers. Or they are just like that man that looks and forgets. What do you look like? Wasted weekend, Lord, without doing and obeying the things that your spirit has convicted them of. So, Father, we know we can't do this without your dear help. But we do pray that by your spirit, by your people, by your word, that we would make those necessary changes. And we thank you that we can be transformed to glory, from glory to glory, even as by your spirit. I do pray that you'll bless the churches that are represented. Keep them faithful. Oh, how our hearts are grieved, even by hearing of this one who is making a poor choice. Another one, Lord, it's just its so frightening. And I pray that you will keep these churches pure, keep them in your word, keep them faithful to the end. May we be steadfast for Christ's sake and for his glory. Amen.